It's my pleasure now to introduce my friend and colleague, Pete Bayou from East Bay Wilds. And Pete, let me just turn it over to you to talk about how to choose shrubs for your native plant garden. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'm covering mostly, I tried to do mostly local native plants in for this presentation. And next, here's a list of most of the ones I'm doing, but next. Okay, they, and I wanted to show a few that these are things that I'm not really going to be covering. And the reason is, this is one of my favorite plants to use in the garden. It's the cobweb thistle. And it does look like a large shrub. It grows quickly into that, but it is a biennial. So it's not, doesn't provide structure for the garden. Next, I'm focused, and ferns are another one that they're, I'm just not covering them in this, even though they do provide Sometimes they can provide the same as shrubbery. Um, same with grasses. Next. Um, it, and then these here, th this is the plumus purple aster. They die to the ground each year, so that's not permanent structure to the garden. So I wouldn't be covering these type of things. So next. Um, yarrow, same thing, dies to the ground. Um, it doesn't provide any structure. So next. Um, and then there's trees, a lot of trees fall in the in-between category between shrub and um, and tree. Um, every it, A good garden for me has, uh, it has trees, shrubs, ground covers, perennials, grasses, and annuals. I like to use all of those in all the, gra the gardens that we do. And a garden doesn't feel finished until it has a little bit of each of those. This is a buckeye, by the way, in the wintertime at the Oakland Museum. Okay, next. Um, this is a garden that we did about 12, 13 years ago in, um, in Castro Valley. And this garden has a lot of shrubs in it. And we used mostly, well, we used a lot of manzanitas for one thing, some unusual shrubs in here too. But manzanitas, there's 17 different manzanita species in this one garden, front yard garden. Um, next. Um, and these these ones I'm showing you just a few pictures of the layout um, of these gardens. This is one that was a collaboration. Well, it was actually Allery Mid Middlebrook and us that did this garden um, over 15 years. Um, it's in San Francisco. And a good garden has color, textures, shapes, um, good composition, and is very aware of, of proportion, proportion that's really about the mature sizes of plants. Next. So I'm showing you mostly mature gardens. This is a mature garden here with the, uh, with the um, wax myrtle on the left, a really tall, like 22 foot high wax myrtle, and then a manzanita on the right, mature manzanita, and lots of other things. Next. So these, these are just about composition. So this is about composition too. Some of these things would be covered like the buckwheat on the left there would be considered a shrub. The other things die to the ground, pretty much. Um, next. So here's more, this is composition and structure that I'm talking about. So this is permanent structure using a lot of manzanitas as well as other things in this garden. So next. And here's another one. This one is in, um, in San Mateo. Um, this garden has a really good combination of shrubs trees um, and annuals as well as perennials in it. Next. And this is the same garden. Next. Um, and then these are ground covers that they can be ground covers and they can be shrubs. So they're, you know, they're in between. There's no, you know, nature doesn't follow the rules that we follow. So next. Okay, once again, top composition and proportion is good in this. So next. Okay, and then this has, this shows how grasses can act also as, um, you know, the, they're, they're not year round. They don't have the plumes year round on these and they get messy at a certain time and they, every now and then they need to be cut back. Whereas other things die to the ground here and other things stay there all year long, like the buckwheats and the silver carpet sand aster is pretty much year round as well. Nice and flat plant. So next. Um, okay, next, That's uh, that. this is for the coyote bush. Um, this is a pigeon point coyote bush. 
at the Oakland Museum that we put in about 12, 15 years ago. Um, shows how really big they get. This is like easily 12, 14 feet across. Um, and it's really important when people are doing their gardens, when they start their gardens, when they're doing it themselves, particularly pay attention to what mature sizes are going to be. Um, and in the beginning, it's going to look spare, you know, but that's okay because you want plants to have enough room to grow to their mature sizes without trying to like prune them all the time to try to squeeze them into a smaller size. So, and I, I've seen a lot of gardens also where things are planted kind of willy nilly without thought as to what the composition and proportion will be. So next, this is the coyote bush again, next. This is a local plant, that's the same thing, coyote bush, with a bunch of different things. Now this is the golden bush. Next, this is the golden fleece, excuse me. This is a local native that I found in the Oakland Hills before. It's not very common, but it's very, very beautiful, especially at the end of summer when everything else is beginning to look a little bit brown. This turns brilliant chartreuse green. Next, next, yeah. And this is it in the wild here. They can get quite tall, six, seven feet tall. Um, and then they, they have the very bright green leaves when everything is turning kind of really dry in the end of summer. And then they have the yellow flowers all over them around um, August, September. So next, here it is again. It's just a beautiful plant that you, I, I never see in gardens except for the few that we planted. And I realized this is one in a garden that we planted, a little baby one. Next, here it is again. It's a great butterfly attractor. Um, but really, this the, the where golden fleece lives, and I've found that they they really come alive at night. California has very extreme conditions, and the full sun conditions are very very different than full shade conditions here. The temperature is just wildly variable here, um, and at night and at night is when a lot of our pollinators come out. This area where I took this photo, we've actually had to use goggles at night. Um, because there's so many bugs flying around. It's just the insect apocalypse or the insect heaven. <laughs> Next. Here it is again. See how large it gets on the side of the road. Um, next. It's a very tough plant. Now we're going to go into buckwheats. Um, buckwheats are really an, an, a very important um, shrub. They're all shrubs. They all stay at least partially um, evergreen above the ground. And then when they flower, it, the flowers are beautiful, but even when, after the flowers dry, next, we're gonna go through these kind of quickly. Next, next. Okay, this is a local one. This is a nudum, Ariagonum nudum, the naked stem buckwheat, next. Some more of it close up, very, very small, um, little balls of flowers on these, but it's a fantastic pollinator plant loaded with pollinators. Next. That's the same, the nudum, next. Um, and then this is a, this this one is a polifolium. The, uh, uh, excuse me, it's the, the it's the cliff, but cliff buckwheat you see a lot in um, Monterey County and South. Um, it, it does do very, very well around here too. And it makes really nice big pillows that are like six to eight feet across and then they get covered with these flowers for a very long time, starting at the beginning of summer. Next. Um, this is a really beautiful one we love to use, the Conejo buckwheat. It has beautiful white foliage and sulfur yellow flowers. This does very well around here too. Next. Next, that's the California buckwheat. California buckwheat with, uh, I'm not sure which butterfly, California sister maybe, or lady. American lady, maybe? I don't, I'm not sure. Next. Okay, this is a California buckwheat. This is a local. It does grow even here in Oakland. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful shrub. And they can get quite large. The straight species, this is the straight species here. It gets to six, seven feet across easily and about three feet tall. So you have to leave room for it, but it does very well and it matures pretty quickly. Um, compared to a lot of plants. So, and, and the flowers last pretty much all summer and then they turn brown. Next. And this is a, this is a, the Shasta sulfur buckwheat. 
it's from the Sierra, but um, it's a really nice one too. It's one that we have in stock at my nursery right now. Next, there's more California buckwheats. This is how they get very large. Next. Um, and this is St. Catherine's Lace. It's not a local native, but it's a beautiful, beautiful shrub for the garden that changes. I really like shrubs which change throughout the year. So they, they look different at different times of the year. They look very different and have a very look, different look. So next, th this is how it looks at, at right now. It, the flowers, are, the buds are just coming out and has this very blue gray glaucous color leaf. And it can be four feet tall, five feet tall even, and six feet wide, eight feet wide even. So next, that's the flower as it's going by next that's the flower also on the the saint catherine's lace next and it's a real and then when the flowers dry they have a chocolate light color and the foliage gets very very white at that time so you have this chocolate color and white and it's it's really not the a dead brown it's more of a russet rich brown so next this is the, the, the Conejo buckwheat, which I love to use in gardens. Next, uh, more Shasta sulfur, next. And this is the Conejo buckwheat when it's not in flower and it's growing with winter glow manzanita. This is a ground cover manzanita that turns this beautiful bronzy red color. Um, and it can stay that color year round too. Um, in the beginning, we thought it was just in the winter that it would turn that color, but it ended up staying that color pretty much year round. Gets more orange in the winter for sure. Um, but I love the con combination of the textures and colors of that white foliage with this bronzy leaf. Um, and, the, and that bronzy leaf, the winter glow is very flat. It's only like three inches tall, four inches tall. So next. Okay, more Shasta sulfur, next. Um, and there are many, many, many other buckwheats. Um, buckwheats and penstemons are the most proliferous um, ge ge genera in California plants. And there's so many of them that have not been tried yet. And we're always experimenting with them. Some of them have leaves that turn beautiful orange red in the winter time. Um, so they make a really nice orange red carpet in the winter. And then the flowers come out. To, and some of them, the flowers are close down close to the leaves and other ones, they can stand two feet tall with the, all these little pom-poms on top. Next. This is the California buckwheat in the wild here. Next. More California buckwheat. Next. This is the Conejo buckwheat in a pot that I've had for about 10 years in a pot. Next. And then this, this is a good, yeah, you can go to the next one. This is one that we've been trying to propagate as much as possible. It's a really low, fl the flowers are really low on it and they tend to cascade. It's a red buckwheat, it's Ariogonum rubescens, but it's one that just happens to have very short stems and they tend to cascade. Next. Um, and then these are a bunch of different buckwheats. I like to use many different buckwheats together in a garden. And the, the white plant in the upper left is the Artemisia californica or the um, California, the coastal sage, or I guess they're calling it California sagebrush now, which is a little confusing because we have another whole group of plants that are related called sagebrushes, but I call it coastal sage. But this particular one is called Montara and it's neat, stays small, has a nice horizontal branching pattern. Whereas the straight species is, is just great if you have a really big garden. Um, and it's great if you can coppice it now and then cut it down. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. But these are a bunch of different buckwheats and sages and the coastal sage growing together. Next. More red buckwheat. And then up in the upper right, that's, a, that's the latifolium. That's another local one. That's um, the coast buckwheat. Next has nice white leaves on that one and rosy colored flowers. This is the Ella Nelson's yellow, which is a type of Ariogonum nudum, I believe. Um, next. And then here's more of the, the local, um, the coast buckwheat, the latifolium. Next. And this is a combination of red buckwheats and 
in the coast buckwheat and they, they tend to interbreed it's what um we call it promiscuous they tend to um cross very easily and buckwheats are one of those that cross very easily and you'll get all kinds of surprises with them for the new ones that come in next uh, this is a this is the santa cruz island buckwheat this is a beautiful shrub uh, and it does best in part shade part sun um, whereas the other buckwheats you for citing them generally you pick the hottest driest part of your garden for the buckwheats they love heat and they really perform with heat but this one the santa cruz island one does pretty well in partial shade does very well in partial shade so next uh, and this is one of the crosses you get. The salmon colored one is one of the crosses we got in our garden. Um, next, more buckwheats, the yellow, Ellen Nelson's yellow on the front left. Next. And this is more of the coastal sage. Next. Uh, more of the California buckwheat. And these are all very, very important. Next. And more mixed. Next. And this is, the, and you can see a little bit of the layout we did. Um, paths are very important in the layout that when we first do a garden, design a garden, we do decide where the paths are gonna be uh, and the access points to the garden so that people can enter the garden, whether it's the homeowner or whether it's, it, you know, it might be a partially public garden or, or many different ways, but different access points are good to have. Just, it's very inviting to see paths and, um, to plan those in carefully and 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 the buckwheats here the buckwheats before they flower they make a nice little ground cover in the upper in the lower right there okay next and now the sages here's a poso blue sage um poso blue is a, a natural hybrid between clevelandii and um the purple um sage next and then this is the this is a purple sage, the white plant there. And this is in the winter. I'm showing you in the winter so that you can see that they look. This one is one of the few sages that looks really good, really pretty decent year round, even in the middle of winter when a lot of the sages just look completely dead. The Cleveland sage is next. The Cleveland sage. This is a, also a purple sage. This is the this one is amethyst bluff. I really like amethyst bluff and the um, point cell spreader. Point cell spreader, you can make a really nice two or three foot high hedge with, makes it just naturally forms a beautiful hedge. Um, and this year, because of the rain, I guess, it's just completely covered with these flowers, the pink flowers. Next, more, next, that's, our, that's Amethyst Bluff. And also I like to plant closer together, plants that are generally gonna be the same size. Um, and here we have the purple sage, a pajaro manzanita, and a Joyce Coulter. <laughs> Excuse me. See and note this, all growing together. And I just love the look when they grow, to, when plants of the same size grow together. Eventually, the manzanita is going to get bigger here. The see and note this will too. Um, and they'll dominate much more. Next. Here's a Cleveland sage. Um, this is this the Cleveland sage. It's so beautiful for a short, for just a short period of time year round, and it's a major magnet for all kinds of pollinators. Next, here it is again. Well, this is the post of blue. Next, the, another one. This is another Cleveland sage, but I wanted to mention one that I don't have a photo of here, and that's Darius Choice. Darius Choice is a great. It would, is mostly black sage, um, which is a local native, um, and that. That one um, does really great in the shade as well as in the sun, as long as it's bright shade or partial shade. And you get these nice big green mounds that look pretty decent year round too. So that, that those two really, the, the Darish Choice and the, the Purple Sages are really good for year round structure and beauty. Next, here's a Winifred Gilman Sage, which is a smaller Cleveland Sage, smaller, about four feet around. Um, next, and then here's another, um, uh, this is, a, I think, a whirly blue, I think, I'm not sure, I don't remember. Next, 
And here's Sonoma Sage. Sonoma Sage is local and it's really beautiful, um, but it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to grow. It, uh, sages in general are for full sun, but there are a few for partial shade. This is one of them. Sorry. Um, but, the, but this is one of them that does best where it's partial shade, not full sun. Um, Sonoma sage, it's nice and flat. It's a beautiful plant. Next. Here it, here it is again, the Sonoma sage. I think one of these days, if we keep trying them, we're going to find one that's really hardy and does well in the garden. Um, and that's something that to think about also that a lot of the non-natives that we use in gardens were developed in Europe and Asia, where they've been developed, where they've been exploring and using their native plants for thousands of years. And so they have all these selections that do really great in the garden and are really um, vigorous in the garden. But in California, we don't have that. We only have, we have actually very short period of time relatively that we've been exploring and using um, native California native plants in the garden. So we have a lot to learn and there's a lot out there that we have not yet found. So next. Next. Um, here's another sage. This is at the Oakland Museum. This is a hummingbird sage overflowing and hummingbird sage has the most wonderfully fragrant next leaves on them. It, it when you first plant them, they grow kind of upright and they look like they just want to get really tall and big, like, and they can be up to three feet tall in the beginning. And then, believe it or not, they get shorter after that as they spread horizontally. Um, and they do make a nice, really fragrant ground cover uh, for partial shade also. Next, it's more of the hummingbird sage. Next, more. Next. The flowers are really beautiful and hummingbirds do love them. Next. And I do like, oh, this is another Sonoma sage. Next. Um, yeah, here's a, an important one. I've only got a couple pictures of this. This, a lot of people, there's certain questions people always ask me. One of them are for plants to screen, to give you a good evergreen screen, to screen off an area that you just don't want to look at a lot. Um, might be a neighbor who's not so nice, or it might be just some equipment, um, some that you just don't want to be looking at all the time. Th this is the holly leaf cherry. This is the local form. The holly leaf cherry, and then there's the island cherry. The island cherry has flatter leaves that are are really big, and that one grows very very tall very quickly. This one grows slower, <laughs> but they can grow both grow very big. They can grow into trees that can be limbed up, or you can just keep them, you can prune them like a hedge um, that can be up to 10 feet tall easily. The, the island one, 15 feet tall. Next. <laughs> Excuse me. I've had some asthma lately. <clears throat> and then we're flipping to, this is a, an elderberry. Next. I love elderberries. This is a blue elderberry um, flowering. They have these greenish yellow flowers that eventually they'll turn pretty white. Um, and then you get the blueberries. Next, this is a fantastic wildlife plant. This is one in the wild. And they're generally shrubs, but they can be easily trees too. If any of you um, went to my nursery before when we were in Castro Valley, there was a very, very large tree in the very center of the nursery back then. And it was 60 feet across and it was an elderberry, a blue elderberry. But that's the largest one on record that I could find. So next. <clears throat> they have a tangle of multi-stems usually. Some people like to grow them as a standard or as a single stem. I don't. I like the multiple stems like this. And anytime they look ratty, which they can, they're very, very fast growing. And if they look ratty, you just cut them down. Next, right to the ground. It's called coppicing. And it's a really wonderful technique that can you can use with a lot of things. But it works fantastic with elderberry. Works great with the coastal sage, um, that is particularly the, the local one that not the selection, which can get huge. Next. Here's a red elderberry. These are great for moisture areas where there's some underground moisture. Um, very beautiful plant with red berries that the birds just love. Next. 
Next, yeah. Then this is the blue elderberry. These are the berries on the blue elderberry. Very, um, very plush looking. Um, I made elderberry pie last year. <laughs> it was kind of a, a disaster, but it actually tasted really good. So next, next, yeah, next. This is the elderberry. You can see the structure of an elderberry. But it's deciduous, so it has no leaves in the winter time. And but you can see the structure and those sweeping branches. The way the sweeping branches that you can really recognize them year round by that of sweeping branches. So next, I guess arching branches would be better. Here's a wild one. Next, another one. Next, another blue elderberry. Next. And now I'm going to cover the, the honeysuckles. Um, the honeysuckles, sometimes they're a vine, sometimes they're, but I, I really think they're more of a sprawling shrub that likes to hang on other things and fences and you can trellis them really nicely. Um, they do like to get into some direct sun, um, but not more than like an hour or two a day of direct sun. And then you'll get good flowers like this, especially if you give them a little extra water. Next. This is the chaparral honeysuckle. This one actually does it, it create a vine and it does climb trellises really, really well. And anywhere you want a vine, this is a, a pretty good vine to use. So it gets covered with these little whitish flowers that um, the hummingbirds and many, many birds and insects love. Next, this is the California honeysuckle. Next, it's native to the hills here, same. And I love the, the, they have different shaped leaves and the leaves closest to the flowers are these huge, they're not even auriculate, they just wrap around the stem. They're really interesting leaves. Next, they're cup shaped too. This is the twinberry honeysuckle. This forms, a, a it can be quite a large shrub. Um, next, another chaparral honeysuckle, next. This is a twinberry honeysuckle that has been espaliered on a house. This is by by Andrea, um, another gardener. Uh, but this is but this is espaliered against house. This is twinberry honeysuckle. Next, this is the orange honeysuckle, which is found in far northern California. Um, but it's a beautiful honeysuckle to use. Needs a little water, extra water in the garden, um, and it does best with, you know, is you know, fair amount of sun, I'd say half a day of sun. Next, more orange honeysuckle, next. Pete, I'm just gonna give you about a three minute warning. Oh, really? We're, oh, wow, okay, let's go through quickly. Next, more honeysuckle, next. Uh, next, that's the twinberry, this is the chaparral, next. Okay, next. Okay, ceanothuses. This is a centennial ceanothus here on the ground and uh, a, a monkey flower here. Um, it, on the left, a red monkey flower. But this, this ceanothus centennial makes a nice carpet. Next. This is another one that makes a nice carpet. This is the Hearst Ranch ceanothus with beautiful blue flowers. And this is a, a ground cover, a very fast growing ground cover. Next. This is the same one, the Hearst Ranch one. Next. And this is one of the local white ones, or deer brush. Next. This is Joyce Coulter, which is a nice sky blue color. Next. And I like the combination. Next. Next. That's a wild. This is Concha, one of my favorites. This one doesn't get too big. It gets about five feet tall by about six feet wide. Has a really nice shape to it. I love using this one in gardens. I use it in almost every garden. Next, some of them can get really huge. Next, uh, this 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 tree on the left hand side here is a Ray Hartman um, ceanothus, and it's about eighteen feet, maybe twenty feet tall. Next, um, dogwoods. Next, the dogwoods, red twig dogwood. On the bottom here, you see the red twigs, and in the back, you see I think they're alders, um, and this is in Point Reyes, but. I love red twig dogwood and it really does well on shady parts of the house, like along an edge, you can make tunnels in it. Um, and even though it's deciduous, next, the leaves turn beautiful colors. There it is again. 
Um, and it gets quite large. It's a large shrub next flowers and it attracts a lot of wildlife. And it's really very carefree if you set if you um, site it right. Um, otherwise, give it a little bit of water um, every couple of weeks and it keeps it happy. Next, the, the fall colors are spectacular on it. That's the red one there. Next, that's the fall color on them. They get these salmony red colors. Next, and the red twigs. Next, this is one we planted at the museum recently. Next, there's the flowers of it. Next, there are other dogwoods too that you can use. This is one of the Aribes speciosum or the show, the, it's the um, fuchsia flowering um, gooseberry. And it's a really great wildlife plant and very, very prickly. So cite it carefully. Next, next. That's the, the color of the foliage in the summer. Next. And this is most for, this is for a fair amount of shade this one grows in too. Next. And it does grow well under oaks. So next. Um, now manzanitas, this is the Mount Diablo manzanita. I'm not gonna get into manzanitas a lot because I have on previous videos, but I wanted to just show a few. Next, that's a Dr. Hurd. Next, um, this is the Morro Bay, it has a very white leaf, the Morro Bay manzanita. Next, this is a, 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 one of the rare ones. This is the Santa Lucia manzanita. It's extremely rare. Next. And this is the Big Sur Manzanita, which I love, which flowers like crazy and stays a nice garden size, about four feet tall, six, seven feet wide. Next. And you can prune them up really nicely <laughs> into little trees. So how are we doing? I'm going to give you like a 30 second wrap up time and then okay. we're going to have to move on, sadly. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more. There's lots more shrubs. But um, really, I hope that you do pay attention to the mature sizes of plants and don't plant things too close to the edges and don't just plant them willy nilly. Look for the, you know, and get try to get the full range of sizes of plants in there and really think about what they're gonna be like when they're mature because it's a lot different than when they're little. So I guess that's it, thank you. All right, so I wanna say a few things before we part from Pete. First, that. <clears throat> Pete has just been such a great colleague for all these years. He's a beautiful designer. He does consultations. He does landscape design, installation, um, maintenance. He owns uh, East Bay Wilds in Oakland. And if you haven't been there, it's a terrific nursery to go to. Um, it's open on Fridays from, I think, 9.30 to 4. Pete is an expert on uh, gardening with natives in containers, if you have an interest or questions about that. Um, He's a beautiful photographer. You can see his work on Flickr, on um, Pete. If you go to his website, you can link to Flickr. I think I even have the link on the Find a Designer page. If you want to find Pete, you can go to the Bring You Back the Native Garden Tours, Find a Designer page. There's his contact information. I think I have his Flickr link. And underneath uh, his contact information are links to the gardens that he has designed <clears throat> that have been on the tour. So you can really see a portfolio of his work. Pete has also done a really great uh, presentation on manzanitas. And you can see that presentation on the Garden Tours YouTube channel by searching. Um, so I wanna say, I wish we could just stick with you and look at your beautiful photos like for the longest time. Maybe one day we'll just do like your special, <laughs> uh, like a special like off tour presentation that's like just you. And then we could really spend all the time we want. But at this moment, <laughs> you have to go. Pete, can you answer some questions online? Yeah. Can you stick with us? Sure. Okay, good. So let me see here. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Pete, for coming. Yeah. And you look very rested after your nice vacation in Mexico. Thank you. I feel good. <laughs>
if you are watching today and haven't had a chance yet to make a donation, if you'll please support the tour. You can do it on the tour's uh, website under please donate. You can Venmo a contribution to at bringing back the natives. We depend upon donations to keep going. And we hope that if you've enjoyed our presentation, that you will help us to keep this event going.